to start sharing then. So welcome to the what are you guys officially the Los Angeles uh, data platform users group? Is that what you guys call yourself? Yes, and we right. are confusingly competing with Los Angeles SQL Server user group on the uh, claiming that we are part of Los Angeles. So, but but that's not. But you claim you claim data platform, huh? Yes. Yeah, that's sort of way. All right. So at the Los Angeles Data Platform Users Group meeting, I'm going to be talking today about Azure Databricks and Azure Synapse Analytics. Now, both of these tools can do Spark and are used for do machine learning. And I assume that most people already know that much about it, but I'm going to do a little bit of introduction to both products and kind of talk about when each product would be a better solution. Um, because they both have situations where they are the best and it's not in every situation. So a little bit about me. My name is Ginger Grant. I am a data platform MVP. I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer and I have been working quite a bit with with Synapse and talking to the um, product team and hopefully I can answer any questions that you might have. I am on Twitter way too much at Desert Isle SQL. And that is also the name of my blog. And I put my contact email information should you wish to get a hold of me later. But frankly, I'm probably faster to grab me on Twitter. All right, so today we're going to review the different the similarities between um, Azure Synapse and Databricks. And then we'll dive into the differences to determine which one is the best solution in a situation that you might find yourself in and match the applications to different use cases. And feel free to ask any questions that you might have. I look forward to answering them and making everything clearer. So, and just as you have them is fine. I don't really care. So, um, so Synapse and Databricks were both designed to be cloud-based solutions. They're both only cloud-based for analyzing and processing data using Spark clusters. So Spark is a file structure that is designed to have a separate compute from the data and it uh, processes data very efficiently by doing massive multi-processing and scales the work over multiple servers. So if the if your process is running slowly, you can make your clusters bigger and that way it can go faster. So you can use this um, to create workflows to process data in a number of different ways. As a matter of fact, I've talked to a bunch of people recently and they have told me how they are doing all of their ETL now with um, Databricks um, because it's been around longer. So I've been hearing more about it because they find that it does it um, more expeditiously. It's pretty fast to do it. So that's another use case for people are now using for, for doing um, Spark ETL. Because both of them are build pipelines and the pipelines are designed to run as workflows to process the data as you need it. So if you want to run a nightly job, no problem. Both Synapse and Databricks will load up a Spark compute process and then turn off the pool when the process is done. And since their versions of Spark are not exactly the same, so I'll get into those differences a little bit later, but what Spark does is it um, fires up a computer, for lack of a better word. In Synapse, they call the computer a pool. In Databricks, they call it a cluster. And depending upon which, you know, how powerful of one you suggest, it doesn't matter. They both take about four minutes to load. They run the process, and then they turn themselves off. Um, that's one thing that people really like about both products is the fact that it's you're not going to say, oh, crap, if you've left on your cluster or your pool over a weekend because they are smart enough to say, hey, no one's using this and they'll turn themselves off, um, saving you Azure spend. They uh, and they're both designed to run to run Spark. So that means that you are going to be writing another language with a notebook to be able to access it. And they both use multiple languages to access data. And these acts and the data, the languages that they use vary quite a bit, um, but they have a core that they support. And the core languages that both support are uh, Scala um, and Python 
And those are the two that are common. Uh, the ones that they both do uniquely is Databricks also supports Java and R. And um, Azure Synapse will support uh, .NET as well. So you can use those languages to perform machine learning or ETL tasks that you wish to use the tool for. So Spark, um, and both of course do SQL. Spark is actually, has SQL as one of its major components. And at a conference that I attended last year virtually, they mentioned that over 90% of the um, code that they process is actually in SQL. Um, Spark SQL starting with version 3.0 is completely ANSI compliant version of SQL. Um, we'll get into differences about versions here in a minute. So the shared feature set that they have is they both support a file structure called Delta Lake. And Delta Lake has gotten to be um, a very big deal because it provides some of the feature functionality that people expect for, for databases on top of a flat file. And what you can do with Delta Lake is you can do, they call it time travel. It's really just logging. So with um, Delta Lake, you can um, snapshot your data so that you can go back in time. You can do index, you can index your, your um, defined tables on top of it to make them go faster. And you could also take a bunch of smaller files and concatenate them into one file. And again, that improves the speed. And those are some features that Delta Lake provides and they both support that to varying degrees. With Python, they both in, um, install the Anaconda libraries so that you have those at your um, availability. They both use notebooks. Uh, they use different versions of notebooks, but hey, a notebook is a notebook. You still are going to be writing code, changing the different cells using magic commands and write, writing some markdown. They both have Active Directory integration, which means that they access the different Azure components uh, using your security. Um, the way that they implement it from an individual basis differs a little bit, um, but they both support uh, that and they both also support integration with GitHub and Azure DevOps for CICD integration. And they both can be used for batch or streaming as well. So Azure Synapse was introduced in November of 2019, actually at Ignite right before pass. And when it first came out, it was um, it was billed as, hey, Synapse is the uh, successor to um, Azure DW. Well, so that's what got released first. So the Azure DW portion of Synapse was released in March of 2020. So um, from that point on, that was the GA product. So you've been able to migrate from Azure DW to the dedicated SQL pool, which is the part of Synapse that contains the Azure um, data warehousing components. But the rest of it, this part that I'm interested, that came a little bit later. That went GA on, on December 6th of 2020. And it's built upon an Azure Data Lake Gen 2. So you actually have to either create one or associate one when you're creating a Synapse workspace because it uses a, an Azure Data Lake as a place where you can do a lot with a serverless pool. And a serverless pool is a pool that is also created when you create your Synapse workspace and that allows you to query flat files. So basically within Synapse, it is um, more of a comprehensive solution than Databricks as it allows, provides three different ways to process data. So Azure Databricks was added to Azure in March of 2018, and it was developed by the creators of Spark as a Spark improvement. They originally created it as a graduate product in Berkeley in 2010, and it was built to help them um, win a net conflicts a contest that Netflix was having with Kaggle to help improve the algorithms for Netflix picks. Um, they didn't win, um, but they did develop the um, Spark um, Apache open source product as part of that. So Spark is part of Hadoop. And with Spark, you have the ability to load. It, it differs from the HDFS Hadoop file structure because that file structure was all about having multiple copies 
and being very redundant. Spark is different. Spark is designed to load all of your data into memory and then process in, a, in each element in different segments and then bring the results together. When doing this, obviously, if you've got more compute, then you can spread that compute along as many computers that you have. And once the creators had released it to the Apache open source community, they thought like everybody else is like, wow, you know, we've got some great ways that we could think of for improving Spark. Well, Spark is also something that you do not have to run on the cloud. You can run Spark on any computer that you wish. But when they decided to build Databricks, they wanted something that was massively parallel. And so they introduced it to the cloud. And actually, it was part of Amazon's cloud um, before it was part of Azure's. So if you do learn Apache Databricks and somebody moves you to AWS, your skills are still fresh because they work in very similar ways. Obviously, the difference would be the integration with the security modules and data resources between the two. And it also has recently come out with in Google's cloud as well. So one of the things that, that, that Databricks provides is a very managed team environment, um, more so actually than Synapse because you can share your individual no, um, folders and notebooks better than it offers it within Synapse. Um, and it's been around a little bit longer. The other thing that Databricks did when they created the Spark improvement, it's not open source Spark. It is actually um, an improved version. What that means is you can't just grab um, your code from um, Spark and run it, excuse me, from Databricks and load it exactly in Synapse. So it, th there are some differences, but question? All right. So um, uh, what that means, what that means feel, is that feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask questions. Yeah. Or you can put it in chat either way, if you whichever sure. way you feel more comfortable. That's not. So I mean, if you were thinking that you could copy your code though over from one to the other, unfortunately, you cannot. Uh, there, there are some differences and. Um, the Databricks community says that their stuff runs up to 38% faster. So um, I think it's kind of interesting in this environment when comparing two products that Microsoft is the open source champion of the two since they are using the open source flavor of Spark. So any kind of Spark documentation that you read will um, work you know, line for line within um, Synapse, but that may or may not be true within Databricks because they do have a proprietary version of it. So some of the feature differences, um, Azure Synapse, unfortunately, is um, only running Spark 2.4 at this point. Um, I'm hoping that they go to 3.0 soon. Um, 3.0 was released in, I think it was April of 2020. Um, it, the Compute resources within Synapse are called pools, and in Databricks, they're called clusters. Um, one thing that, that that Synapse does, naturally, it being a Microsoft product, is, is that the SQL that it runs is T-SQL, which is nice. You don't have to learn ANSI SQL, which is what Databricks um, runs. Um, Spark 3.0 is fully ANSI SQL compliant. So any if you're writing code and you're using um, Spark 3.0, the SQL version, is of course ANSI SQL. The language differences between the two are different as well because Synapse supports um, .NET and um, Databricks supports R. And of course, the GA uh, dates the December 4th, 2020 versus March of 2018. So let's actually take a look at the two different products and see how they look and what how their environments are the same and how they are different. So look, pulling up Azure here, I've got a couple of different resources. First, we'll take a look at Synapse. And Synapse is a um, total environment. So when I have created it, by the way, creating it is a pretty simple process to be able to do. I won't um, bore you by going through it. But um, one thing that you do have to do, which is kind of um, unique, is you must, again, have a, I'm a um, Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage account. You could either create one or you can um, add one of your existing ones as your primary because a primary one is required. The other thing when you are creating your 
Synapse workspace, notice it here, it also asks me for my SQL administrator username. This is used for the data warehousing components of Azure Synapse. Now, you don't even have to um, install those um, to um, as part of the environment. You, that is, of course, a setting that you can choose to implement or not, but it will prompt you for that um, username and password when you create the workspace. If you don't feel like filling it out and fill it out later, that's perfectly fine. Um, documentation is here, and here you see my pools. And I said that I didn't have to have a um, warehouse pool, but I do. This is my built-in pool. This is created when my workspace is created. And these two I added. So I added a Spark pool and a warehousing pool. And um, this is a dedicated pool, and this, of course, is Spark pool. So we're going to go ahead and open up Synapse and see that you open are opened up into a completely separate environment when you do that. So um, opening up my Synapse environment, I um, this is where I'm la I've landed. Um, if you're interested in learning this yourself, there's some the I really recommend taking a look at these learn elements. Great place to use immediate samples, browse a gallery and do a tool. You can um, start using code right out of the box. So it's a real neat feature to be able to um, to be able to incorporate that right off the bat. So opening up this, we have our home section, which is where I just was. And then I've got my data section. Now in my data section, I've got a number of different databases. I'm putting air quotes around those because notice that I have different names and different icons next to them. This database here is an actual Azure SQL DW kind of database. This is a dedicated SQL pool. So I've got tables, external tables and resources contained within in this. This also runs using a dedicated SQL pool. And with dedicated SQL pools, you're charged every minute that it's running. And so I'm cheap and I don't have it running at this moment. Um, I'll start that up so I can show you how to do that and also allows me to do some demos. I also have a couple of um, data warehouses. You'll notice that they've got different icons. These are logical data warehouses, which means that they are data warehouses that I have created using flat files. So they don't really exist as databases. I've logically created them, but for all intensive purposes, they act like real databases and I can connect to SQL Server Management Studio or Power BI using these virtual databases. And to take a look at them, I can just select the top 100 rows off of them and then run them. And I'm in my little SQL window, oops. And I have broke this when I was playing around with this today, but. Other than that, this, if I hadn't been playing with this, this worked just fine. I also have a couple of Spark um, warehouses here too. And the Spark one that I have is I am connecting to Cosmos. So I've got some data elements associated with the Cosmos DB because I can query that from within Synapse. And I also have created some Spark tables where I have um, that I've created again off of data frames that I've created within Spark. Now, remember I said I wasn't running my data warehouse um, pool right now. Well, let's take a look at what pools that I have so I can start them up. You'll notice here, this is my dedicated warehouse pool and it's not running right now. I'm gonna go ahead and start that up. The other pools that you can see that I have here is I have an Apache Spark pool. Apache Spark pools do take about four minutes to run. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this as well. So, and I'm going to do that actually just to show you some different variety outside in the Synapse workspaces. Okay, so back in here though, then I can look at monitoring any pipelines that I have running, triggers, and integration runtimes. So um, this auto resolve integration runtime is also created when I create the workspace. And for those of you who are familiar with Azure Data Factory, ta-da, that's what this is about. This is the integration runtime that is used in Azure Data Factory. If you have done stuff with Azure Data Factory recently, you'll notice if, if you look at the documentation, all the documentation says that, that, that it works in Synapse as well. 
So not only does Synapse do data warehousing, allows you to query on top of flat files, but you can also write ADF code within there. Now, the only thing that you cannot do is you can't do lift and shift of SSIS code. If that's what you want to do with your um, with your ADF kind of code, then it won't work. But I can create different kinds of pipelines using standard copy data elements, just as if I was doing, um, and this is telling me that my pool just started for data warehousing. So, but this is um, another flavor of ADF. Um, if for those of you who want to shift all of your code um, from ADF to Synapse, unfortunately, there isn't a great automated tool for that. Um, from a cost perspective, it's the same. So you're not going to get different cost benefits from doing one versus the other. Um, the feature that the version of Data Factory, which is, of course, an integrated in integration within Synapse has, is it has the ability to call notebook straight from Synapse, which of course is not something that directly you can do within a pi data pipeline. So of course I can monitor everything that is running and then do management. So let's go back and look at developed. And under develop here, you can see that I've got a number of SQL scripts and then I've also got notebooks. So here I've got some um, integration with Azure Machine Learning, which naturally that I can do um, with Synapse. Um, and I can also do different um, experiments. Here I have a bank classification um, set of machine learning where I'm analyzing bank data to determine um, which bank customers are going to be likely to open up new um, CD accounts. My cluster, my medium synapse pool isn't running, but if I want to start it, I can just go ahead and start this and it will start running. It does take a couple of minutes for it to start running as well. So these are kind of the highlights of Synapse. So let's now take a look at Databricks. So going back to Azure, of course, within Azure, I have the ability to create a Databricks workspace. So my Databricks workspace is similar to the way that the um, Synapse workspace is set up in that I've got my nice documentation here, getting started, um, giving me some tips as to how to, to perform some various tasks, which are pretty helpful. And then it's gonna, I'm gonna launch the workspace. And when I launch the workspace, once again, I'm put into an environment. Notice I've got um, connectivity direct um, using my Azure Active Directory. Um, and it's going to open up my Databricks workspace. Now, Databricks workspace is based, it, you know, while I said that they do have similar um, feature sets, you're not going to see data warehousing, uh, Azure Data Factory components, and the ability to query flat files of native T-SQL in here. This is just the Spark portion, so which is roughly now, depending on how you look at it, a third or a fourth of what Synapse does. So it depends if what you're looking to do, of course, which tool that you would select. If you are just looking to compare um, whether or not you want to do what I call, um, and actually uh, Ewan gave me this tip, uh, yet another uh, Spark interface, uh, Yazzie, then um, these, that's the two items that you can compare these to because that's the feature set where they directly compare. So in my Azure Databricks session, again, I have separate compute and here my compute is called a cluster. Now there's some little different elements um, when creating clusters, obviously, that um, are worth noting. Um, I do have termination. Um, generally speaking, it does a longer time frame. Um, before it turns itself off, I have set it to 20 minutes. The other thing that differs between the two is that with Databricks, I can choose to select a compute resources that uses graphical processing units. Graphical processing units basically allows you to harness the power of high powered video cards to allow you to process the, your Spark faster. And you may have heard of people using video cards to uh, mine Bitcoin because they're also used for uh, applications like that. But they're being more and more used for machine learning tasks because they add to the in-memory compute that you can use to um, 
improve the processing of your code, which I think is kind of funny. So you have like giant server farms that have no monitors attached with with high powered graphics cards and they're not looking at anything. It's just for processing data. Um, naturally, with um, Databricks as well, we have a number of I have a number of different notebooks. So um, here I've got um, and once again, I have to start my cluster. Which I should have done here. And it's going to take again so somewhere around four minutes to start. And once my cluster is started, then I can load and run my data. And here I'm analyzing um, some data for um, airplane crashes um, to see um, how the different data elements look. So again, I have a similar sort of notebook environment here where I'm writing code. Um, I can um, I'm running here in Python. I can change to do um, different magic commands like I do here to run straight SQL, um, which is similar to the kind of thing that I can do within um, Azure Synapse. So this gives you an idea of some of the commonalities between the two and also some of the differences between the two. Uh, Ginger? Uh, yes. Quick question. Sure. Uh, what would be the cheapest way to start? Meaning either Databricks or Synapse has some free trial account? Well, so the Microsoft knows that people are trying to evaluate the differences between the two. And so from a price perspective, they're very competitive. In terms of um, how much it's going to cost you to do things, that greatly depends on what you're looking to do. If you're talking about, I want to set up a logical database uh, on top of a bunch of flat files, you can do that for t by querying and it costs you $5 per terabyte, which is very realistic. If you're talking about, I want to write Spark to do machine learning, then if you pick a smaller cluster or a smaller pool, your pricing is going to be relatively the same. But is there a free version? No, you I'm are going to be just, just to start with. Like a developer edition, I guess. Um, there is one for Databricks. There is a starter um, version that has a limited time frame that you can use once. I forgot about that because I burned through that a long time ago. OK, um, fair enough. Yeah, um, you can always use an Azure free account, but it's not it's not set up to it's not like, say, cognitive services where you can like do the free one. Um, but there are a lot of things you can do that it's not you can do a lot of things that it won't run you a lot of coin because again, pick a smaller server um, and you know, don't run massive terabytes through it and it's not going to run you a ton of money. If you want to save your Azure spend, don't turn on, don't create dedicated SQL pools and don't turn them on because that is the most expensive thing you can do. That, believe it or not, creating data flows in integration is also an expensive thing to do. So if you stay away from those things, it's not going to run you out of house and home. So, Got it. So there are a couple of things that people shared. Uh, can you decide if Azure Synapse is right for you? So there's some link for people. There's some community.cloud.databricks login. It's free. Oh, okay, so there are some options. Yes. Um, Thanks, Jamie. Jamie also mentioned that Databricks, and I forgot about this because I don't use it much. Hey, Jamie, that there is a free version of Databricks. Um, they do have that they do have, but it's not an Azure version, so it doesn't al allow you to do the integration. Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, it's AWS. It runs on AWS, but it is free. You can keep using it and using it, but it's not like it's uh, uh, yeah, it's not it's not in actually Azure. But I use it for right. my class that I teach at A and M. Perfect. Yeah. So the one thing, I mean, it's it's great for, so it'll do everything except for helping you learn how to connect to Azure resources. And it won't help you with that because it's for the AWS. So, um, and it is very limited as Jamie's, Jamie's saying too. So um, really happy that Ewan could make it. Ewan works for the Microsoft Synapse product team. So he's checking, he's uh, keeping me honest here. Um, any other uh, specific questions about it? Uh, any other comments you uh, want to make? Nope. All right. 
So, um, Azure Synapse, as you saw from my brief walkthrough of the two products, is more than uh, a Yazzie, which is yet another Spark interface. So it, it allows you to analyze your data that you have in your um, data lakes. I can tell you that one of the things that I have done, and I actually have a proposal out to a client right now where I've recommended doing Synapse, is we're doing going, well, I hope they, they buy off on it, but what I'm going to be doing with Synapse is I'm going to be using the um, Azure Data Lake Gen 2s with a hierarchical file structure as if it is a operational data store. So we are going to collect all of the data that they have from their different subsystems and put them in a data lake um, and can create a um, virtual um, set of data marts we're going to be using for Power BI reporting. Um, for smaller data sets, the, and I'm going to be doing that for, by um, cre creating queries off the flat files of my data within Spark and creating dimensions and facts and persisting those within my data lake. So, and um, we may be importing those directly into um, Power BI if they're small enough. Um, or we may be loading it into a data warehouse if, they're, if their needs grow. One of the things that they said is, well, what if we want, you know, I said, well, it's gonna, not it's gonna be as fast. I'm not gonna say that you will ever get the kind of speed that you're gonna get a bunch of, of flat files on, on um, Data Lake, but you're also not paying that kind of money either. So it can be a very economical way to organize the data and create a data lake house um, within the cloud. So it's it's a great option for that. Now, of course, um, it's this isn't when if you're talking about comparing it to what Databricks can do, that's not really a comparison because Databricks doesn't do that. If you want to do a direct compare, what you're looking at is um, I want to write some code to do Spark. Which one is the better tool for me? Um, which one will meet my needs better? And um, that's a that's a different question because they contain different elements. A little bit more about what you get with um, Synapse. You get data warehousing, you get SQL pools, you get integration, which is the ADF components, um, and you get Spark notebooks. And in addition to that, it directly integrates with Power BI. You can integrate Power BI into the Azure um, Synapse workspace, as well as create um, databases that you can use as data sources within Power BI. It also fully integrates with Azure with Azure ML, allowing you to um, call elements that are included within Azure ML and also use the auto ML features that are part of ML within Spark as well. It's got full integration with Cosmos DB and they have announced this isn't a uh, um, MVP NDA stuff, I saw this on a public page, that they are going to fully integrate with Azure SQL DB. Now, this is going to be awesome because when they do that, then I can integrate flat files with my um, SQL DB, which I'm really looking forward to be able to do that as soon as this is out. Um, and I have no idea when, and I'm hoping for a hint sometimes to when that might be available, but it's not yet out. But it's coming soon. So also it's fully integrated with both um, Azure DevOps and GitHub so that you've got support for your you know, um, CICD uh, production rollout capabilities. So this is um, all, everything that you get within Synapse. So it, it is pretty um, wide featured and more than just Spark. So Synapse has got integration with the, your Azure Link services as well. So it provides very um, Azure ML support, um, support for cognitive services, and of course, Power BI integration. It allows you to do data warehousing, and you can use T-SQLs on top of flat files, Cosmos DB, and Azure SQL coming soon. Um, and you can do that from within the environment versus within, not that you can't do some of the, that within um, a data databricks, but when you do that, you are going to be writing code for it, and it's not going to be with a same kind of a notebook environment for writing T SQL that's available within Synapse. 
Um, Synapse integration is the same code base as Azure Data Factory. It runs as an integrated runtime. And hey, since integrated runtimes are, um, and that comes with it, but you can, of course, create new integrated runtimes if you want it to go faster. And you can, of course, incorporate any kind of persisted tables that you create within your logical tables and notebooks that you have within Synapse. Um, and Synapse also is the only one that has a full on data warehouse included within it. So this is your large petabyte, you know, if you have got more than a, than a terabyte worth of data element for um, your data, this is where you're going to want to put it. So it's high performing access to big data. They did add a lot of improvements from um, the original um, D, um, SQL DW when they migrated it to Synapse. So it's not just a lift and shift. They've also included a number of priority elements so that if you you can actually say if my boss is writing a query make sure that he's got the highest priority so that his queries run really really fast but you only need to give him that priority between like between uh, nine and four because we know he doesn't do any work outside of those hours and you can set that up within um, synapse in the data warehousing component within the dedicated sql pools also it has the ability to it separates compute so as well, just like it does within Spark, so your compute, you can scale that up and down. If you know you've got a big job coming, you can create a larger dedicated pool, run on that, switch back to the, to the um, other pool, pause it as you wish. You're not going to be losing any of your data and do a lot of the standard data warehousing tasks, um, including you know hooking it up to, to Power BI or um, other tools if you're going to do large scale reporting. So also only in Synapse is T-SQL. So you've got persisted um, SQL queries. You can do exploratory analysis, um, logical databases, and databases connected with Azure linked services as well. So um, it's got a lot of uh, feature functionality with a T-SQL flavor, which is great for those of us who grew up learning it. And it's also got full ML integration um, as, as well. Oops, I, don't know what happened to the text there. And also, it's got very good integration with cognitive services, which is incorporated in terms of ML immigration. It also provides a no code option um, for, for both um, for Azure Machine Learning. So you can, um, of course, incorporate the components that have been created with Azure Machine Learning to have it um, select different um, algorithms for you and it supports the text sentiment analysis and anomaly detection of cognitive services. Also, it is fully incorporates Power BI integration. You can use it for exploratory analysis. Um, you can include a workspace within Synapse for Power BI reporting and create views for virtual um, data warehouse. But um, just to note, if you do incorporate Power BI within Synapse, you bring your own license. It's not included in the Synapse licensing, um, you would have to have an existing Power BI account naturally to be able to take advantage of it. You don't need premium. A pro account will work. Um, yes, it has to be a pro account. No, you can't use a free account because you are incorporating a workspace and sharing that. Um, hopefully that there will be, um, there's a push that uh, Microsoft has announced to look at um, incorporating some Power Query type experiences. Uh, that's not um, that's not there yet, but that is something that they are looking to incorporate at at some future times on their the roadmap. So let me take show you some additional features of Synapse, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what you can do in Databricks to give you an idea of what the two el different elements can do. So taking a look at um, Synapse. You'll see that um, I've here I'm using it to do um, machine learning, um, executing um, a experiment so that I can analyze my data. Notice here, this is how I would access my data. Here I'm um, accessing my data lake using my root container and my relative path is that it's in raw and I'm getting a file name called bank CSV 
And I'm saying that I want to read that into a data frame called Spark Read. And then this is my this is my data. If I wanted to though not write code for this, I could also do take a look at that data outside of code. So I'm going to go to data. I'm going to go to linked. I'm going to go to my Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 and Synapse. You'll see I've got a number of different Azure Data Lake Storage uh, included here. And in my root primary, you'll notice I have a subdirectory called raw. And in it, I have a file called bank CSV, and I can take a look at that too. So I can take a look at my raw data. Here is a SQL command, or I can create some Spark code to analyze it as well. So I've got this um, capability to do like clicky draggy stuff, or I can, you know, go full on in and write some Synapse code to be able to do that as well. I've also, um, um, I showed you the fact that I've, I've got a Cosmos DB connected to this as well. So I can query Cosmos and take a look at data that I've got contained within, within Cosmos. Um, and I've also created some integration data sets. And these data sets are data sets that I've created when I have um, created integration. And those exist for me as well. So I can do things like copy to Parquet a little bit um, and, and use the wizards and everything else that are available within ADF that you may already know. A little bit about data storage. Don't want to like bore you all with, with all the intricacies, but if you're looking to build a data lake, more and more people are moving to the Parquet file format, which you may not have heard of, but it is a compressed file format that uses something similar to the VertiPack engine that's in Power BI in that it's columnar based and does compression, which is why a lot of people, yeah, butter, I know, I have an icon for that in another presentation, um, where it, a lot of people are using it because it will compress the data on your um, storage so that it'll actually be cheaper to store because it is compressed. Um, and it's not human readable though, but it's much faster for doing any kind of um, file-based analysis. So I've got, um, of, I've got, you know, different elements here. I've got, you know, different data. I've got a number of different scripts to create a logical, you know, data warehouse. The, these are the commands that I would need to do. I've got to create my database, create a master encryption key, and then um, specify my my storage. Here's my, I'm using a shared access signature, and this is what I need to create a logical data warehouse that I can start putting data into. So I can do a lot, a lot with it. Um, taking a look at um, some other elements that I can do. Here I am using the AutoML components, um, so incorporating that. And what I'm doing here is I am um, calling, um, that I'm what I'm doing here is I'm calling my Azure ML workspace. So this is the workspace name, um, my resource group, my region, my subscription ID to import my Azure ML so that I can um, use the components within it to have it select an algorithm for me. So I'm having it pick my regression algorithm for me using machine learning to pick the best machine learning algorithm. It runs through it, it'll create, it'll look through the parameters that I've set for it and then get me the give me the best model. Um, and this is fully integrated with Azure ML so I could go and look at my results within my workspace that I have specified, that I've specified here. So, um, there's a lot of different elements of things that I can do. I can, you know, explore my data with Spark, look at fixing data, doing um, ETL, uh, create different data frames and do a number of different components. So there's really a lot of things that I can do within here um, in addition to just writing machine learning, which of course is the fun part, right, Jamie? Um, that it's to, this can actually be an environment for all of your data so that you can incorporate um, databases, flat files, create data warehouses, and analyze it all in one environment. 
So it off offers a lot of different feature functionality. And I really think that, you know, as more companies become used to using this environment, I mean, I get that it's only been GA since December, but really going to um, find that the, the features are, are really um, useful and also not terribly expensive, especially, and especially for those people who are looking at creating a data lake house as being the repository for their data, which we're, I'm seeing more and more companies want to do because they need they don't want necessarily everything on a server because it's really not worth paying for that kind of access because for data that they may not need like that. Like for example, um, GPS tracking data. You, it's useful to have that raw data, but you don't need all that in a database most of the time. So it just gives you an idea of some of the things you can do within Synapse. Now, only in Databricks, not to give them the shaft because Databricks is a very good product. It's proprietary version of Spark. What that means is it can go faster. Um, the way that, and it is using um, Spark 3.0 versus 2.4. So with the proprietary version of Spark, um, it can process your data more quickly. So it, it can't, especially when um, loading things up into data lakes, it, um, excuse me, delta lakes. Um, it, the delta lakes within Databricks um, perform better. Um, because again, they're proprietary, not open source, and they save the good stuff for themselves. Um, the compute resources, you can use a higher, um, you can use GPUs, which are not available, so you can use additional compute resources. Uh, so it, and it will perform uh, machine learning tasks really well. You can also incorporate um, Azure Machine Learning with it, of course, not to, a, not to the same degree. Um, but it is a very good for that. The other thing that it um, does very well is, um, and I just kind of discussed these topics, is it really integrates well with other language UIs and it has um, partner integrations with model management. Uh, so it's got uh, additional partners that, uh, that it is partnering with to help um, better access information. It also um, provides better a better environment for sharing individual elements. It's much easier to share an individual notebook within the um, administration of Databricks than versus the integration that exists within Synapse. Um, and the Data Lake integrations are tighter so that you can incorporate that functionality and it's got a tighter integration than exists in Synapse. So if you're just doing straight um, Spark, and you don't care about some of this other other stuff, and you the most important thing to you is that your Spark runs as fast as it possibly can, and you want to make sure that you've got a um, the fastest access you can possibly have for, on your flat files using um, the features that are available within Delta Lake. You might decide that you want to use um, Databricks. Another strength that it has, it, it handles Kafka streaming very well. So if you're interested in doing streaming with Kafka and processing it in near real time, because um, it does micro batches, that's what Spark does. It doesn't do a full on stream, but hey, micro batches work pretty well. Um, you might also be interested in the way that Databricks performs. So it just depends on what you were looking at. Again, though, Microsoft has made sure that they are very competitive when it comes to pricing. So there's no there's no price performance difference between one versus the other. So don't do it for that one. Um, the GPU compute provides the ability to have the fastest compute possible and it increases the overall capacity. I will say that you're gonna pay for that. Um, so buyer beware, but it is kind of a neat feature and it um, is optimized for doing machine learning so that you have that um, additional feature functionality. So let's actually take a look at um, Databricks and see the kinds of what it has that it makes it unique and special. So within Databricks, um, actually looking within the workspace, um, you also it also contains model integration. Now this particular one, I don't know how many models set up, but it has its own internal model management so that you can register your models within Databricks, making it easier to call. Um, with Synapse, that is handled within machine learning, so it's not part of the application. Um, it um, handles jobs, just like jobs are available within Synapse. Of course, these jobs are all going to be 
created using different Spark components. Um, questions? No? All right. And so you have also um, the ability to create internal um, internal databases as well and internal um, tables that you can add as well. Um, it, it contains the ability to create, to house smaller data sets within the environment so that you don't have to go out to resources to be able to access it, which is kind of a great way of being able to um, handle that particular administration um, function. Ginger? Yeah. Good question. So I see the Spark 2.3, Spark 3.0. Uh, what's the difference? I mean, uh, it has more features. I mean, uh... so the major improvements. Well, there's there's a list of them, but like the things that come to mind. Obviously, the like the later versions are always better, right? Um, I will say that um, within Spark, there's a couple of features that people are really excited about being part of um, the latest version of Spark. And one of them is when you're writing SQL in Spark. Until 3.0, it wasn't ANSI. So it was more like SQLite. There are some things it Got wouldn't it. really do. Um, but with with three two yeah, with 3.0, you write it, you're writing ANSI SQL. The other thing that's a big thing for Python users is that um, Spark implemented, actually, it's in the version that is in Databricks. They implemented a new data frame, and that data frame is called Koalas. The Koalas data frame is just like pandas which is a very popular data frame used within the Python community. And you can replace the word pandas with koalas and it'll work the same. While there is a version of, of koalas in the version of Spark that is contained within Azure Synapse, the later version has better support. And got those it. are the two things that come to mind. Um, Jamie, you got any like things that you know come to mind, difference that, that, that 3.0 added that I can't think of besides those? Yeah, I mean, like TensorFlow support. It's one of the stuff you can do in TensorFlow. You can do in the and Apache Spark 3.0 as far as being able to use some of the distributed stuff in TensorFlow. That's another thing. Yeah, and you and Bit mentioned the AQE is also available in in 3.0 as well. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that Microsoft is never going to add it because I have been told and I have seen on various roadmaps that um, Apache Spark 3.0 will happen, but it's not there now, just saying. And it's got async scheduling for different compute resources as part of 3.0 as well. So. But with that, I um, wanted to kind of wrap this up. So which one's the best fit? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to create an environment where you're integrating Python with your Azure Data Factory? Are you looking to do data warehousing? Do you want to write your Spark components using .NET? And are you a real big open source person? Because if you if those things match your environment, then Synapse will probably be a better fit. Um, if you are using Databricks, maybe you want to do streaming with Kafka which it is uh, pretty strong in doing. If the latest and greatest Spark features are your thing, if you want to write um, your Spark code in R, then you're going to be wanting to use um, Databricks. And if you want to use the version of Spark that goes the fastest, that's in Databricks. So as far as you know, which elements are the most important to you, kind of weigh those out when you determine, hey, which one do I want to use? Um, and like I said, the code is not exactly the same since they're running a proprietary version. So if you do choose to um, go from one to the other, you can't exactly cut and paste your code and have it work. Close, but not exactly the same. So you can use both. There's nothing to say that you can't um, use that when you need it. You can call Databricks jobs from within Synapse. Um, you can use Databricks for targeted um, ML tax. Maybe you're you use Databricks because you are using the TensorFlow components. Um, you want to use Synapse for data warehousing, which of course Databricks doesn't have. And you want to create data lake house with serverless. Do that in Synapse. Um, does 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 Synapse and ADS support Python 3.0? No, not yet. They will someday. I've been told, but not at present. So good question. So you know you can think about which what you're doing in your environment and to determine, 
hey, maybe I want to use um, both of them. And that's a great solution. Use the tools that help you do your job better, depending on what you want to do. Um, so also think about what's the best fit for your environment. Do you have a lot of .NET coders that want to run to, who want to write Sparts? Um, oh, 3.6. I'm sorry. I, I read that as Python 3. Point. I read that as, as Spark instead of Python. I'm sorry. Yes, it uses 3.0. As a matter of fact, Databricks doesn't move to supporting only 3.0 a little while ago. I'm sorry I misread the question. Thanks to Ewan for the clarification. Um, so which one's the best fit for your environment? Um, do you, uh, are you going to want to do .NET? Then you're going to want to use um, Synapse. Are you wanting to do full-on integration with ADF all in one place? Um, do you want to do streaming with Kafka? Because if you're doing streaming with Kafka, then it is probably some, you might want to look at doing Databricks for that. If you want to do a data analysis of your flat files, you want to build a data lake house and you want to give people the ability to query it, then you're going to want to use Synapse. Um, as, is Spark, if, is how fast your Spark runs, is that the most important thing to you? Well, if that is indeed the case, then you might want to look at using Databricks. So, you know, just think about what you want to do and which tool is going to, per and then think about which tool is going to be doing it for you. Now, if you just want to make life easy on yourself and you know you want to do some things and you're not sure, if you want to have a full gamut, um, Azure Synapse has a great, has a wider set of features than is available as I've shown you here today. So in summary, we've looked at the different common elements of um, Azure Synapse Analytics and Azure Databricks. And we detailed some of the feature differences and talked about which one is best for your environment. So with that, let me know if you have any questions. If you can't think of any questions now, but you're sure you're going to remember them just as soon as I ring off, then ping me up on Twitter and I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. So. Anything else? Oh, and the, do not forget to enter the t-shirt raffle when there is a form for that. Hi, Ginger. Yes. Hi, uh, I have a question from usability perspective. Probably have experience with both. Uh, Databricks uh, in AWS and Databricks in Azure, what is, I don't know, more convenient to use or pretty much is the same? There's very few differences between what's provided because Databricks is, of course, you know, it's owned by a third party company and they're looking to have it's the similar applications between the two. Obviously, what differs between the two is the connectivity between the environments. So AWS is designed to integrate with AWS components. Um, and of course, within Azure, it's designed to work within Azure components. It, it has integrated security and it integrates better to Azure storage elements, which you might expect. But uh, other than, mm -hmm. those are the major differences. Uh, from integration perspective, Synapse seems to be the answer to many kind of, you know, like, uh, questions or let's say integration dilemmas that you uh, need to address. Uh, is there any uh, analog uh, of Synapse in AWS, because I just don't know about it. You know, um, I'm not as familiar with AWS as I probably should be, so I don't know of any, but my knowledge isn't very deep. So take that for what it's worth. Um, how do you deal with a large number of small file problems in, in Synapse? Well, within Synapse, if you've got a number of small files, you can um, query those as if it was one um, using the uh, serverless pools. So if you've got, say, a file generated every hour and you've got that stored within a folder, you can query that as if it was one element. So, um, and you can also, with um, both Synapse and with Databricks, if you've got a whole bunch of small files, you can use Delta Lake to treat them as one file within the Delta Lake environment. So two different ways of doing that. Any other questions? Does Databricks support open source SQL relational DB? What it supports is ANSI SQL using um, uh, Spark 3.0. And it also connects, I mean, very well to all the, the Azure database components. So you can definitely connect to 
an Azure SQL database, or you can connect to Synapse from within um, from within Databricks. But it's not a and if you want it, but if you want to query a flat file, you're going to need to do that from within uh, Spark uh, Magic Command and access and you know create access to the elements you want to do. So hopefully that answers your question. Is a pool analogous to a resource group? A pool is actually analogous to a cluster. So a pool, imagine a pool is a server. So you're picking a server that you want to run on. It's it's basically the server, and that's what it is. And because compute is separate from the data, so imagine this: you've got your your SQL Server, and that's got you know x amounts of memory on it. But your database is a is a SAN, and that's kind of how it is in the cloud. So you've got your server, and then you've got an external resources where your data lives, and that's analogous to both a pool and a cluster. Does that make sense, Vinny? You're welcome. Do you still need data lake for landing? Um, that's your choice. You don't have to land data in Data Lake. Um, I like doing it because I find it to be an inexpensive way of doing it. I understand files will still be mapped as a single table. Databricks supports re reparation, coalesce, and optimize for compacting smiles and demand to manageable files. Does, SQL, does Synapse have the equivalent command for reparation and coalesce? Um, Ewan, thank you for answering that question because I was going to ask you. Um, it, so the answer is it does not have optimize, but it does have um, repar um, repartition and coalesce. So thanks, Ewan. Any additional questions? I have another question. Uh, sure. I, I read someone in use that again. Uh, I believe Synapse kind of extended the uh, data sources that you can uh, read data from, and AWS is one of them. Uh, yes. No, no company likes uh, to go kind of multi-cloud. And for example, in our company, we already did some, I'd say, minor implementation. What what we can call data lake, taking data from multiple business units and just organizing them pretty much yes in, in data lake. If we even try signups again, I don't know from perspective of just okay, does it even make sense, or we need to go like all full in AWS? Or I mean, signups seems to be a great thing. It does make sense to kind of to the, do the kind of cross from one cloud provider to another? Well, you can. I mean, you can integrate. I mean, let's face it. There are many situations where you don't have the ability to dictate the cloud. Mm -hmm. So, like for example, if I have to get if I if, if my company has Salesforce data, I need to get it from Salesforce. My opinion about Salesforce is irrelevant. You know, I'm it's not a Microsoft product. If we're using it, then I need to connect to it. I can do that easily using a link service within um, Synapse. I can also connect to AWS if I want to. I can connect to an Oracle cloud, an IBM cloud, um, and as a matter of fact, there's samples as to how to do that in Synapse. So while it's kind of like from a developer's perspective, hey, my life is easy. If all I ever, if the only thing I ever have to deal with is Azure. Um, I just don't think that's realistic um, because different organizations have adopted different things, and you know, once they're there, nobody wants to get rid of them. Um, but you can use um, Synapse to get data from wherever you happen to have it stuck. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions? And Steve, is this the part where you do the raffle? Uh, yes, so it's usually done by Elena, okay. uh, but I think she's actually going to be doing it right now. Um, so our only requirement is she's going to mm -hmm. run the randomizer. Our only requirement is person needs to be present, and this needs to be U.S. shipping because we cannot afford the non-U.S. shipping. I hear you there. I shipped something to uh, New Zealand uh, late last year, and I was shocked at how much that cost. Yeah. Hey, Steve, I can help you with that. No worries. <laughs> any other any other questions? Ship to uh, Canada an option. I, I think yes. 
Canada's Canada's just America's hat. Yes. <laughs> One more question. Hearing more about the Data Lake House, um, are uh, SCD is a, a feature of Data Lake House. So I use the term Data Lake House because um, when I'm creating it, it, it's I'm making it more into a data warehouse than just a data lake where I have different things. And I have to do it the way that I choose to, it's our attic, the way I choose to organize it. So it's a distinction, it's a, it's a term that's gotten to be more common. I kind of like the connotation of it because yeah, I am curating the data when I create a data lake house to an environment that is similar to a data warehouse. I'm just not bothering to move it because I can use it within um, my uh, Azure Data Lake Gen 2 and with Synapse and with Power BI, and I don't have to put it into a database. So that's why I call it that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's basically a method of organization because in my data lake house, I've got fact tables that are files and I've got dim tables, which are, which are files. And I have different processes that I use to do that kind of ETL from different data sources. Sometimes they use ADF. Sometimes I use um, the Spark, depends on the condition of the data and where it happens to live. So it's kind of neat because it offers a lot of examples, especially for people who have tight budgets. Uh, I guess we'll give it a few more minutes for people to sign up for the raffle. Um, as it's supposed to be, the less people, the higher the chances are. But <laughs> we're trying to spread uh, the winning capabilities of each uh, as much as possible. Yes, Synapse supports merge. Thank you, and I really appreciate um, all you guys coming, especially um, those of you who are from way different time zones, people who happen to be in uh, Brisbane, Australia. I don't know what time this is here for you, Mar uh, Marty. Uh, just FYI, this is our uh, most attended session ever. Oh, that's awesome. I think this was more than 25 people. Well, that's what I wrote down. Uh, you, uh, I think so far the highest was Kimberly Trip, and I think oh, wow. uh, <laughs> I think your session actually few more people. Wonderful. Can you can you get to know the insert update delete count from a syn synapse merge statement? Um. I need a specific, more specific example so that I could give you a more appropriate answer. Oh, glad to know that, Martin. So, um, yeah, I need to, that's kind of, I can't, give me more data and I can give you a better answer, uh, Sam. Okay, well, let's uh, give it one more minute. Final minute for uh, the raffle, T-shirt raffle. Interesting, Sam. Hey, Ewan, would you be willing to um, mention if there's any kind of information on um, Delta Lake 7 Plus support in the near future? Watch him go quiet. You mean give away the secrets? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, so the last version of the open source uh, Delta Lake, which is what we use, um, is 0.6. Point one, which runs on Spark 2.4. The higher versions of open source Delta Lake don't run on 2.4. So once we ship 3.0, we'll have support for open source Delta Lake 0.8. And there's a bunch of interesting differences. The most important one I suspect for this crowd is that it has full support for DML and DDL 
operations. You were talking about the ANSI-ness. And so that mm -hmm. comes in in Delta Lake 0.7 or 0.8. It's been in Databricks for a while, <clears throat> but they had to uh, hack the metadata catalog to get it to oh, work. So it doesn't work, their own, their own catalog. <clears throat> So it doesn't work on the open source implementation until you get the 0.7 or 0.8. And so today, if you want to do any sort of DDL uh, operation or something like a merge statement, for example, uh, you must do that in C Sharp because we did a full implementation in .NET. Um, Scala is built in, PySpark is built in, but you'll get ANSI SQL support with later versions of Delta, but it does rely on Spark 3.0 before we can deliver that. Just curious, is there anything published regarding the um, proposed release schedule for Synapse? You know, I was just thinking about how other applications say, hey, we're looking to do, you know, three major releases a year. Is there any kind of um, documentation for any kind of release strategy for Synapse? Uh, Synapse in general is continuous delivery. Synapse Spark is dependent on the open source community. So, for example, you had mentioned that uh, Spark 3.0 was, it was between April and June. I don't remember either exactly when it came out last year. Um, but since then, there was a 3.01 was the only other release last year, which was a quick hot fix. But this calendar year, um, well, actually not technically this calendar year, the last six months, they've delivered a 3.02, a 3.1, a 3.11, and they just uh, branched the code for a 3.2 release. And so we're driven by open source releases because one of the things we do is we stand by releases for long-term servicing. So we can't pick up every single minor build that comes out. That's why when you look at the properties of your Spark pool, it doesn't give you the build number. It only gives you major minor because we deal with the build numbers under the cover. It's part of being a managed service. Um, and so we've been chasing a tail a little bit on Spark's wheel because they keep feeding the goalposts. And their, their release schedule has not been seen to this sort of we did an analysis of all the release schedules going back to Spark 1.6 to look at when odd fixes came out, look at when minor releases, major releases came out, um, mapped everything out, and then we moved far faster on the than we were on previous releases, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and every, I mean, you mentioned some of the cool stuff in Trio, but every uh, minor version of uh, Trio that's come out so far, I don't see the new kind of So the community's doing a very nice job. I was kind of, I was kind of wondering because I was hoping, I, I knew that it was in, in planning for a while and then I was surprised I had a good idea. Yeah, yeah I mean, one of the things that you, you touched on at the beginning that's worth emphasizing is that we don't really think about the same as a product. We think about the same as a product that is not for the two engines. So for example, in the run of the year last year, there's a whole bunch of sparks so that we can get things like managed units where they can get the learning center up and running, which accrue value to all of Synapse, not just the Spark piece. And that's always our goal. Our goal is to be the, the best kind of big data processing engine as part of Synapse, not the standalone best data, uh, big data processing engine, like, for example, Spark and HD Insight. Uh, you can run uh, an HD Insight cluster with one of the Spark and then it's just a pure Spark solution. Um, our solution is then part of the suite um, and not the standard one. Yeah, and you know, really appreciate the DevOps and GitHub integration. Uh, that happened yeah. last week in November. Yeah, that was that was one of those things that held up some other specific features. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we got a solid starter at the door with the DevOps the ITD work. Yes. There's a lot more work still going on. Um, and it, there's some of it being improved in small bites, and then there's some big bites as well that we'll just take off going forward. Perhaps I will see more in two weeks. Depends how good your bribes are. Hmm, I'll find out your address. I know people. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, Yelena ran the randomizer, and the winner is Paul Apodaca. Where to go, Paul? Paul, raise your hand or voice uh, uh, your joy of winning a raffle ticket, um, raffle t-shirt.
Paul? He raised his hand. Ah, yeah. OK, in that case, it's wonderful. We're going to reach out to you for the shipping and uh, we'll ship you the T-shirt. It's actually take us a time to design stuff. Uh, but again, I think we this time I think we got it under control. Well, thank you all very much for attending. I really enjoyed being a part of your user group and I look forward to do it. Um, do you think it's worth learn, learning Spark if you already know Synapse um, and ADF? Yes, because um, there are things that Spark can do that's, that, that ADF cannot. Um, even from an ETL perspective, good luck using ADF to try to do HTML <laughs> or really messed well, up I, data. I can, yeah, Ginger, I can tell you just even before Synapse, we use ADF and we actually use Databricks and basically Spark SQL to do some ETL transformations that we couldn't do in ADF. And so we actually combined our ADF pipelines with the Spark SQL and Python and Spark to do that. It can also process really large files faster too. And I do see a lot of companies doing quite a bit of ETL using Spark. Yeah, this is a billion row data set. Yeah. And good, yeah, don't don't try doing that using a data flow. <laughs> yeah, that'll never resolve. Yeah. So well, thank you very much. Appreciate it being here. And I will have to come back again and, and listen to your later speakers since you seem to have a lot of really good stuff going on. Sure. Thank you, Ginger, for your session. Thank you at for attendees attending uh, March 2021 SQL, uh, SQL, Los Angeles Data Platform. I keep mistaking it from time to time. Uh, Ginger, maybe you can uh, introduce people to your user group. Oh, my, my user group? Yes. Yes, um, we are on Meetup. It's the Arizona Data Platform Users Group. We meet the second Wednesday of every month. We are also going to be throwing a Data Saturday using uh, for Data Saturday Southwest on May 15th. We're uh, accepting speakers until this weekend, um, so get yours in before Sunday. And also, we really hope to have a lot of people in the U.S. attend our um, our Data Saturday. So go to the datasaturday.com website and check us out. And while you're there, you can also check out the Data Saturday for LA as well. Theirs is later in the year in June. Oh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Glad somebody's got the link out. Uh, next up is 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 uh, Jeff Anucci, who's going to be doing a non-technical topic for once. So, and thanks, you, and for answering the questions that I didn't know the answers to. And with that, cool, cool, cool. I... all righty. Thank you so okay. much. Awesome. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.